Today we are going to be talking about Garmin's running dynamics. Now their heart rate straps monitor these and create data for you to interpret and we're going to talk about what these are, their relationship between them all and also if they're actually something that you can use to improve your training. First things first, we're going to break down the holy trinity of the running dynamics, which is the relationship between cadence, vertical oscillation and ground contact time. Starting off with the easiest and most important of the three is cadence. Now this is just the amount of steps you take per minute. For most advanced runners, this will usually look at a cadence above 180 steps per minute, but for most, the target should just be anywhere between 170 and 185 steps per minute. Basically, as the higher your cadence goes, the more smooth you're going to look. You've got less bouncing up and down and you're gonna have less force going into the ground. Now, if you're a runner who's currently injured and you know that your cadence is less than that 170 steps per minute, then increasing your cadence can be a great cue to help you in your injury recovery. Increasing your steps per minute by five to 10% can be a great way to reduce the ground reaction forces that you experience when you run, which can reduce some of the impact from the overuse injuries that you might have. A great way to practically do this is to use a metronome. So set the metronome at your desired pace and then run to the beat of that metronome. A really important thing is though, is as your cadence increases, your speed should not increase. It should say the exactly the same. When you increase your cadence, your step length will actually get shorter and this will mean that you won't run at a faster pace. Now the premise of increasing your cadence and its relationship with reduced injury risk leads us perfectly to the next one in our holy trinity, which is vertical oscillation. Now vertical oscillation is the amount your body moves up and down as you run, specifically your torso. And a normal range for this is between five to 13 centimeters. Now, as running is a horizontal activity, you want most of your energy to be contributing to that movement to propel yourself forward. And if you have a high vertical oscillation, it's actually not efficient energy use because you're using a lot of energy to move yourself up and down. You're spending more time in the air and thereby you're actually gonna be reducing your cadence. This therefore can increase the amount of forces that are going through your legs naturally because you're moving up and down more and you're hitting the ground harder. And this can therefore explain why there's an increased injury risk with those lower cadences. A good prompt to improve or reduce your vertical oscillation is to try and lean more further forwards. This will allow to translate that energy into that forward motion rather than the up and down, and this will naturally soften your foot contact and the forces associated with it. And naturally, this will just smoothen out your running technique. You can think about trying to hit the ground softer, and naturally this will make you into a much smaller vertical oscillation. This leads us into the third prong of the trident of running dynamics, and that is ground contact time. Now, ground contact time is exactly what it sounds like. It's the time in milliseconds that your foot is in contact with the ground with each step you take. Normal range for this is between 200 and 300 milliseconds with elite runners getting less than 200 milliseconds with each step. Now, if you think back to elite runners cadence, that's above 180 to 185 usually, and their ground contact time is less than 200 milliseconds. So you can see naturally that as you increase your cadence, you reduce the amount of ground contact time you have. Now, if you have a heavy overstriding running technique, this will usually show in your ground contact times. It'll be slower or higher than that 200 to 300 millisecond range that most runners fall into. So the big thing that affects ground contact times that you can adjust is overstriding. This is when your foot is too far out in front of your body when it strikes the ground, and this naturally creates a braking effect which can increase the amount of forces going up into your legs. And this naturally will increase your risk of overuse running injuries. Now, overstriding doesn't have anything to do with what type of foot placement or foot striker you are. It's all about the positioning of the foot relative to the body when the foot hits the ground. So an easy way to cue this, to make this improvement, is to think about trying to get your foot to strike the ground more underneath your hip rather than out in front of you. Now, if we think back to this relationship again, the longer your foot remains on the ground, this will reduce your cadence. So if you want to improve the ground contact time, you can actually try and increase your cadence and naturally that will change. Or you can do the opposite and you can try and speed up your ground contact time to improve your cadence. You've just got to remember that cadence, vertical oscillation and ground contact time are all interlinked. You usually can't change one in isolation. As you change one, the others will change as well. This is just a great thing for you to know because then you can know small tweaks that you can make to your running technique in order to make changes to these measurements. 
Now, before we go on, remember running dynamics are not the be all and end all. You shouldn't be studying your running dynamics after every single run and obsessing over numbers because this will likely not lead to any improvements. It will just lead to obsession. Think of these dynamics as just data that you can look at in order to you to make potentially informed small changes to your running. So now we're gonna dive into some of the more lesser known and less important running dynamics that the heart strap monitors. So ground contact time balance is just a comparison of your ground contact time between legs and expressing that in a percentage. So it's a measurement of the symmetry of your legs in relation to the ground contact time. If the symmetry is identical, it'll say 50%, 50%. If they're not symmetrical, it'll usually have an arrow pointing to which side, so your left or right leg, that is spending more time on the ground, and this will be the higher percentage. Now, I wouldn't actually recommend using this measurement for anything with your running technique. There's no point as you're running, checking your watch, trying to make your legs symmetrical in their ground contact time, because you're just not gonna be able to do that. This is purely data for data's sake, in my opinion, and it should be more used as a reflection rather than actively trying to change your technique. To be honest, it actually makes a lot of sense. If you're injured and you have a lack of symmetry between your legs, naturally you're going to be biasing and spending more time on your good leg to try and offload that injured leg. Now, if you're uninjured and there's a disparity, don't try and change anything. We know that a lot of different people have a lot of different running techniques. And if you're running unimpeded and you're running well, even if there's just that asymmetry on your watch when you're running, it's not a sign that you should change things. There's no such thing as the perfect runner and everyone has unique running styles. If you do try and make changes when you're not injured to try and make it 50-50, you'll likely just disrupt your own running system and then this will probably increase your chance of injury. That now takes us on to stride length and that's just the distance that you take between your right and left step as you run. And this is usually expressed in centimeters or meters. If you're running faster, your stride length will usually increase if your cadence is remaining the same. And vice versa, if you're increasing your cadence but keeping at the same speed, then your stride length will usually shorten. If you think about professional runners like Ilya Kipchoge, his stride lengths are extremely large and long. They're about 1.9 meters, I think, because he's running so fast with that cadence around that 185 steps per minute. Now lastly, and most confusingly, is vertical ratio. What this is, it's the direct relationship between your vertical oscillation in centimeters divided by your stride length in meters. And this is expressed as a percentage. And then the lower that percentage is, this will show that you're a more efficient runner. An example of this is that if you have a low vertical oscillation and a higher stride length, this is going to be a lower vertical ratio, which means you're a more efficient runner. If you think back to what we were talking about before, running is a horizontal pattern. So basically, as the vertical ratio gets lower, it's saying that you're able to cover more distance with less vertical oscillation. So if we go the other way and you have a really high vertical oscillation, but a short step length, you're gonna be spending a lot of your running going up and down, which is inefficient running. So your vertical ratio will be higher. Again, I wouldn't obsess over these numbers. There's something that you should use to reflect on, not be using in real time. I would go and focus on small technique changes that we've mentioned or in previous videos that we've done, work on increasing your cadence, and then come back and see how the vertical ratio has changed over time, rather than trying to change it as you're running in real time. If you go on and think about those cues that can improve your technique in running, you will see these improvements naturally happen as you become a more efficient and experienced runner. Now lastly, you may be able to look at running power. And what this is trying to do, it's not perfected science, but it's trying to express the amount of energy you're expending in terms of wattage, kind of like the same as what cyclists measure. So it will take all of those running dynamics that we've mentioned and also take into consideration your heart rate, and then it will be able to spit out a power reading. So the higher the reading, the more watts, and that's basically showing that you're using more effort as those watts go higher. Now, I don't believe the science is all there with power readings, and I don't know how accurate they actually are. For me personally, I haven't tried to use them yet, as I more focus on heart rate formulas or rating of perceived exertion, which I think are better ways of tracking your intensity as you go between your easy threshold and your interval style runs. Now, some Garmin's go into HRV or heart rate variability, but my watch doesn't actually do that, so I won't be going into that today. If you have any questions for me, make sure you drop them down in the comments. I'm very keen to chat about it. Far out, I actually love data. I find the numbers super interesting, and there's so many different ways you can track and monitor how you run 
It's just important that we don't get obsessed with it because then that can potentially negatively affect your training. Spend your time focusing on the big building blocks of running, not obsessing over the little numbers all the time. Just make sure you use the data more as an interest and to keep in the back of your head rather than a constant obsession. If you found this helpful today, guys, please drop a like and subscribe because that really helps us out. It helps us produce more content and we're really keen to create a community of everyday athletes who help each other out with their fitness goals. That's it for today, guys. See ya.